Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam, and together with Brad TV, we're continuing the reading of the Shabbat portions from the five books of Moses. And this week, we have arrived to a brand new saga, story, that is one of the most important and influential stories in the whole five books of Moses. It begins the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob, and Rachel. And we start reading from Genesis 37, verse 1, to Genesis 40, verse 23, from the Law of Moses. The accompanying passage in the prophets is from the prophet Amos, chapter 2, verse 8, to 3, verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. And from the book of Acts, it's chapter 7, verse, verse 9 to verse 16. It's a beginning of a new story. Jacob returned from the land of his mother's family of Assyria. And uh, from the city of Haran, which was one of the great cities of the ancient Fertile Crescent, He arrived, he made reconciliation with his brother Esau that actually wanted to kill him, and he doesn't kill him, and he falls on his neck, and they kiss each other, and they basically make a kind of peace, at least between that first generation of Jacob and Esau, a kind of peace. And Jacob settles in the land, in the land that God gave Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the land of Canaan, and he's become a wealthy man. He's got lots of flocks, and he's got 12 sons, and uh, Joseph is one of them. He's a son that, that was born to Rachel, his beloved wife, and uh, Jacob and his whole family survive from being shaped. Jacob and his family survive with his family from being shepherds. They were shepherds. And being shepherds, uh, you, you have a large flocks. You have to have a lot of people that are shepherding these flocks. And he was one of the boys, younger boy, that was with his older brothers shepherding the flocks. The text says, opening statement, this is the history of Jacob. The next word, Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flocks with his brothers. And his brothers that he was feeding the flocks were are the sons of two concubines of Jacob, Bil'ah and Zilpah, his brother's concubines. Wives, it says in the text, in the English translation. And Joseph brought a bad report of his brothers. In other words, he was the younger brother, and he was tattletale. He was telling his father all the bad things that his brother, older brothers were doing. In any family, that doesn't settle very well, does it? I don't think so. Not only in the family, in any neighborhood. If you've got a bunch of boys playing together and doing foolish things, and one of the boys goes and rats, snitches, stooges against his friends, what's going to happen? They're going to dislike him, even hate him, maybe even ostracize him, maybe even ignore him maybe even don't want to play with him and don't want to be around him. Nobody likes a snitch. But that's what Joseph did. The question always rises up in rabbinical commentaries, why did Joseph do that? 
Was it because he cared so much about what is right and what is wrong and what is fair and what is unfair? Was it because his brothers or half-brothers were doing some things that are bad and terrible and damaging uh, the, the reputation of Jacob and his whole clan, his whole encampment? Or was it just because that was his character, to be a snitch? The text doesn't tell us. But the next verse, verse 3 of chapter 37, tells us something else. Israel, that's the other name of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed by the angel uh, uh, that he wrestled with in the river Yabok crossing the river Yabok, crossing the Jordan to enter the land of Canaan, and the angel changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Very different names, totally different meanings. Jacob means somebody who, who, who follows you, you know, who, who is a follower. Israel is somebody who is a hero who fought with God and won the battle fought with that angel in the river and won the battle during the night. And verse 3 tells us, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. So not enough that Joseph was a snitch, was telling his father all the bad things that his older brothers were doing. Now his father Jacob loves him more than he loves the other boys. In any situation like that, we are talking about trouble. We're talking about scandal in the family. That's the not natural, normal thing to, to, to happen in any family. If you have a child, younger child, who's telling his father what his older brothers are doing wrong and trying to get them in trouble, it is going to cause problems. And the fact that it says that his father loved him more than all his brothers, the return to that is that his brothers hated Joseph and would not speak with him, would not play with him, would not associate with him, would not keep peace with him. They didn't want him around. He was somebody who's telling the bad things that his brothers are doing to his father, getting them in trouble, and that never works out right. But in addition to all this sociological behavior, another element comes in. In verse 5 of chapter 37, another element comes in. God intervenes in this situation. God gives Joseph a dream. And he, being a snitch, goes and tells his brother, I saw a dream last night. If you have a dream like that, don't go telling it to the object that is involved in that dream to the people that are involved in that dream and he said oh brothers come here hear the dream I have here is my dream we were all binding sheaves harvest time spring time let's say after Passover between Passover and Pentecost and they're harvesting the wheat and they're all harvesting the wheat and tying them together into sheaves. And behold, my sheave, the one I harvested, the one that I packed, stood upright. And all your sheaves were around me and they were bent over, bowing down to me. 
your younger brother. We've got already four points that are against Joseph. First, his father loved him. Second, he was tattletale, a snitch, reporting to his father what his brothers are doing. Third, he saw a dream in which his sheave was standing upright and his brother's sheaves were bowing down to him, giving him honor and homage. And the fourth point, that he was not wise enough to keep his mouth shut. And he go, goes and tells his brothers about his dream. In any society, in any neighborhood, in Jerusalem at least, that you have a kid that does that kind of thing, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be, as we say in Hebrew, yelet kafut. Yeah, he's going to be a kid that is going to get smacked from here and from there in the neighborhood. At best, if he's lucky, be ignored. But not in my neighborhood, he wouldn't have been ignored. So, the brothers are not happy. They get angry. So, we're going to let this little boy, this little, uh, you know, our young brother rule over us? We're going to let him tell us that he's going to be the, the big sheep standing up and we're going to be bending over, worshiping him? No, sir. That's not going to happen. That was the brother's reaction. And it is a normal reaction. You know, people say, oh, oh look how bad his brothers were. No. They were normal. The unnormal thing was Joseph. Joseph was not the normal guy because he wanted his brothers to bend down and worship him. That doesn't work in any society. But that's not the only dream. He has more dreams. Another dream. He is the son. And his brothers are the stars. And the stars are going around the sun and paying him, paying the sun honor and homage. And the brothers uh, and his father rebuked Joseph and said, what do you think? Who do you think you are? You think that I and your older brothers, your father and your mother and your older brothers are going to bow down and worship you? It's not going to happen. No way. The level of hate and the level of alienation in the family is growing. But that's the normal sociological pattern that would happen anywhere in any society and in any family of that kind. Now, don't let the uh, your minds wonder, ah, oh, look at these Israelis, look at these Jews. They hate their own brother. No. If it was in Korea or in Japan or in China or United States or in France or in, in, in any community, somebody behaved like Joseph, the same thing would happen. They would hate him. They will alienate him. So... As we continue the story, because of time, I have to uh, go faster a little bit. His father says to Joseph, your brothers have gone to Dothan in the land of Israel, watching sheep and flocks and, and, uh, and cows and goats. It has to be kind of a, like a Bedouin situation. You move where the grass is. So they were there near Beersheba, near Hebron. In the south, semi-desert land or desert land. So it says, your brothers have gone north up the main road through the crest of the mountains from Hebron to the Jezreel Valley. And they've gone to Shechem, mountainous, green area, fertile area, cooler area to feed the flocks. So it says, go to check on your brothers. He stayed home. 
because his father loved him. But now his father is sending him on a mission, go check on your brothers. So he goes to Shechem and he looks for his brothers and he can't find his brothers. And uh, an old man meets him. I don't know who this old man is. His name is not in the Bible, but uh, it's an interesting story. And, and the old man asks him, young man, what are you doing here? What are you looking for? He says in these words, for my brothers I am looking. And this statement is significant because it shows, especially as the Hebrew text presents it, that Joseph didn't hate it. His brothers hated him. He didn't hate his brothers. He liked his brothers. He loved his brothers. And he's not responsible for the dreams that God gave him. I want you to, to understand this point, dear brothers and sisters. Joseph didn't make up his own dreams. Joseph did not invent those dreams. They were revelations from God. They were prophetic revelations from God. If he was wiser and understood more his family situation and his brother, maybe he would have been wiser to keep him a secret and keep it to himself. But he, he, he loved his brothers and he wanted to share his dreams with his brothers, which brought his brothers to hate him more. So he says, the old man says, your brothers were here, but they've gone up to Dothan. Dothan, I would say about 10, 15 miles north of Shechem. Fertile valley. Very fertile, green valley in the springtime, beautiful place. A city was there in the time of their patriarch called Dothan. So go, Joseph goes there to see how his brother is so he could bring a report to his father. But his brothers see Joseph alone, away from home, quite far from home, maybe a couple a hundred miles, between 150 and 200 miles away from home, on foot, alone, and they say, here comes this tattletale, we'll take care of him. And they start debating among themselves. One says, well, let's kill him. Another one says, let's not kill him. Judah says, you know what? Let's sell him. Sell him as a slave. You know, he'll be away from us, taken away from us, and not with us, and we're going to make some money out of it. They agree to do that. They put him in a well. I don't know if the well had water or not. Either way, a well is a dangerous place to be, not only because of the water, but because sometimes poisonous gases gather low. Poisonous gases usually are heavier than the air, and they stay close to the ground. So if you have a well, the, these gases fall into the well, and they are at the bottom of the well. Very dangerous. And they put him in the well and they decide to sell him and they're waiting for a customer to come and uh, buy him. They were hoping that, uh, you know, travelers would come and, and buy Joseph out. The... Uh, they're on the route from the north to the south. And the, the caravans that are going along the Via Maris, which is not far from Dothan, on the seashore coast, between the low hill country and the, and, the, and the sea coast of the Mediterranean. Where are they going usually? If they're, going, they're going either from Egypt north or from north down to south to Egypt. It was his brother Judah who said, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. Is Judah 
doing it to save Joseph or to make money? I say the Judah is doing it to save his brother from dying. That's why he wants to sell him. And playing on, on, on his brother's greed. How do I know that? Because toward the end of the story, Judah is willing to take the place of Benjamin and be imprisoned in Egypt in order to save his brother. He's got a good heart. Yeah, he may be a good businessman, but he's got a good heart. And he's doing it maybe for both reasons, to make some money and to save from killing Joseph. Now, they want to sell him to the Ishmaelites. They put him in the well. Well, while he's in the well, another group comes. A group of Midianites. Another nation, also from the other side of the Jordan River. And they hear Joseph probably screaming from the well. They pick him up. They pay nothing. And they take him and they take him to Egypt to sell him to Potiphar. Uh, a minister in Pharaoh's government. And the brothers don't make any money. And Joseph disappears from the well. And the Midianites take Joseph to Egypt to the slave market. And they sell him to a minister named Potiphar, an Egyptian minister in Pharaoh's court. And Joseph is in, in Potiphar's house. And very quickly, out of his excellence, Joseph becomes the economos in the Septuagint. He becomes the master servant of the house, the maître d' in French, of the house of Potiphar. He was a good-looking young man, a young man. Potiphar's wife kind of liked him, not for uh, adopting him as a child, but for sexual reasons. And uh, the story rolls on from there. Joseph refuses to have sex with her, with Potiphar's wife. She screams and claims that he sexually harassed her. The other servants arrest him, and he ends up in jail. The man that had these dreams that all of his brothers are going to bow down to him, now he's a prisoner in a strange country, in Egypt. And I have to cut the story short for Brad TV now, but I suggest that you read the whole, the whole Torah section from chapter 37.1 until chapter 40, verse 23. Read it. Because what happens is this. Wherever Joseph goes, he excels. That's the secret of Joseph. Wherever he goes, he excels, but in his own house, he didn't excel. In his own house, he was hated by his own brothers. But among the Gentiles, Joseph excels. And in prison, he serves everybody. He helps everybody. He becomes kind of a, like, like a foreman in the prison. And if people have problems, they come to Joseph to ask him to help them solve the problems. This character of Joseph will carry on to the end of the stories of Joseph and actually to the end of the book of Genesis. And I'm going to end here in our portion with Joseph in the house of Potiphar as a slave being accused of sexual harassment of the mistress of the house, of the wife of Potiphar being put in jail, in Egyptian jail, and he has all kinds of escapades in that jail. You read it. We are going to continue with the next section in the Torah next week. It gets more interesting and more fascinating, and I'll t tell you the secret. The story of Joseph has so many parallels, similarities with the story of Yeshua, of Jesus, and the Gospels. His own brothers hate him. The Gentiles take him from the well. 
they sell him to the to to a Gentile kingdom empire. Egypt was a huge empire in that period, and in the end, he turns out to be the savior of Egypt, of the Gentiles, and of his own brothers. In the end. They recognize him as who he really is. Joseph, our brother. We're going to continue this saga, this story, next week. God bless all of you. Please read the texts. Shalom from Jerusalem.